video and whatnot. If you're not sure where the link to the video is, we have a new website. Uh, our church, uh, David Garner, put a ton of work in, and our church has a new website now. And uh, it's the start of a, a new place for us to collaborate. Uh, Her uh, Perry, wherever he is back there, is going to do some videos for youth and going to publish some youth videos over in the coming weeks. We have a new member portal where you can get uh, updates on announcements and whatnot. Please go out and register with that. And if you are looking for the link for the videos, any of the videos that we want to watch here, uh, whether it's the live stream or the, uh, the recorded videos, if you just scroll down just a little bit on the home page, we have two links, one to YouTube and one to Facebook, and you can get to the live stream from there. So all you need to know is our is our website so if you go there you can get there and uh, also as you go to the new website if you have feedback or whatnot please uh please let david know that moises me harold scott know uh it's a ministry it's a place to reach out and to connect with each other and also with our community and so if you have insight and thoughts of how we can leverage that website better please 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 let us know uh, it's wonderful to be here this morning in, in one scripture uh, I was just thinking about uh, the beginning of a year, and Lord willing, we'll have a year to uh, to minister to our community and, and to the uh, missions that we have, and uh, thinking about the beginning of the year, I'm thinking about the race in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and following, it says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray together. Father God, so very thankful that you've given us this day, uh, that you've given us this time together as we are to worship you and to lift you up in prayer and to uh, study your ways and your precepts that, uh, that God, that we can uh, obtain your wisdom as we reach out to this world. Father, we're, we're thankful that we have the time to sing and to uh, together in that way. And we pray that, that, the, that the words that we sing and the, and the thoughts that we have that we lift up to you are, are pleasing and acceptable to you as you are our audience of this worship. God bless this worship, bless our time together. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you all here. As we begin our worship, let's sing, Oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend before our opening prayer, let us sing, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. O Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove while the hopes of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor 
daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's through our belief and our faith in Jesus Christ that we come before your throne this morning. We thank you, dear God, so much for all of the wonderful blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the blessings of this church, for the leaders, and all the people who are participating, all the brothers and sisters, our, our saints in the Lord. We thank you, dear God, for all of these wonderful spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Dear Father, we, there's so many things on our minds at this time with our friends and loved ones and brothers and sisters of their sicknesses and their illnesses and the troubles they're going through. Dear God, we pray that your blessings and your comfort will be upon them and help us to be able to comfort them in whatever ways we may be able to find the ability to do it. But we thank you, dear God, for this scheme of redemption, this plan of salvation that you've provided for us. We thank you so much for sending your son to our planet to be able to save everyone who will believe in you through our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for the church. We thank you so much for everything it does. Dear God, we recognize it as the pillar and the foundation of the truth and of the gospel. We know that the gospel goes forth from the church itself in no other place. Let us remember that as we live our lives every day, that without the church and without the members of our church, the message of the gospel will not, will not go where it should. And to that end, dear Father, we pray for all of the missions that we're involved in, overseas, Honduras, Nicaragua, as well as the ones here, the ones in Washington, the Sun, Sunset School of Preaching, all of the other things that we reach out to the other communities in the world. But also, dear God, we want to pray for the things we do here, especially our youth. They are the next leaders of the church. We pray, dear God, that uh, we will instill in them the, the faith uh, that we have and that they will never, ever stray away from it. We pray, dear God, that whatever we do will we'll, we'll provide the right examples for our, for our members here as well as the, our, our children, our grandchildren, and indeed, yes, our great-grandchildren. We pray, dear God, that that message will go forth down through the centuries from, from here and that we will, the things that we do here in our lives will, will be very effective and help others throughout the coming years. We thank you, dear God, for everything. We thank you for the great country that we live in. We pray, Father, that the leaders that we choose will continue to, to allow this great republic to, to go forward and that we'll continue to enjoy the religious freedom that we have and all the other freedoms, economic freedoms as well, and that we'll be able to worship you in spirit and in truth without fear of intimidation, without fear of persecution. And dear Father, we think of all the years gone by and the centuries of how, how awful and terrible the things happen to Christians who um, who even today throughout the world are, are persecuted. Dear Father, we pray that that persecution would end and uh, that they would be free to worship as we do. And we pray we'll continue to be able to worship the way that we want to, <clears throat> the way that we will 
worship you in spirit and in truth. And dear Father, we, we pray that this country would continue to grow and become strong and overcome this terrible pandemic that started from a foreign country and, and in a very, in very bad way uh, came into this country. Dear Father, we pray that we'd overcome this, that these new vaccines that are coming will do the job and that we will return once again to, uh, to our fellowship, to be able to hug each other, to be able to carry on just like we had before. Dear God, help us to remember how wonderful the things we have that we always take for granted so often. And it, it's not until we lose them that we see how valuable they really are just like being able to go to church, dear God. It's a wonderful blessing to be here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before our message, let us sing Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Hold on, let me change the key on that. <laughs> he will never, never leave me, nor forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With this man, no hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Thank you, Chaz. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to open it to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, just read a few verses in a minute as we talk about our enemy. You and I have an enemy, a common enemy. And so many times, this is Christianity 101, but so many times we fail to even speak of the enemy, to teach about the enemy and to even reflect on the enemy. And I wanna take some time this morning just for a few minutes to talk about our, our common enemy. People don't like to say they have an enemy. We, we want everybody to love us. We want everybody to like us. But you and I have someone that is against us. They are accusing us. They are constantly searching for ways to destroy us. The Bible speaks about these things. Jesus personally talked about our enemy, his greatest enemy. And so for a few minutes this morning, I want to talk about these things. By the way, the enemy does not want me to speak about these things. Satan does not want me to talk about these things. I'm convinced about that. In fact, every time I get to do a lesson like this, I don't think it's um, fate or, you know, luck or bad luck or... You know, I, I literally, like Moody, I know, I know Satan's real because the Bible says he's real, but also because I've done business with him. And the last time that I was supposed to, to do this lesson, to preach this lesson, it was already in the bulletin, and I was supposed to be here on a Sunday morning. It was six or seven weeks ago, and instead of coming and preaching this lesson, Kay dropped me off at the emergency room and I walked in to check myself into the hospital for 15 days. 
I don't think Satan wants us to even dwell on the fact that he's our enemy. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that we are at war. There is a spiritual battle going on, and it's constantly going on around us. You and I are doing battle every day, and it, we have a relationship not only with God, but we have a relationship with this enemy, the devil. We're either an enemy or we're a friend. And either way, uh, we recognize that the Bible speaks about this, this real enemy. Now, he's brutal, he's attacking, he's unrelenting, and I think he's described best for us here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Now, 1 Peter 5, I love these, uh, the verses at the beginning. They're really talking to elders and about the, being responsible for what you do and also that one day we'll answer to the chief elder. And then it speaks to young men, and then it talks about casting our cares upon him and, and, um, and being humble in the way we treat one another. But then it comes to these words here. Uh, they're found in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, Peter writes. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering that you're experienced by the brotherhood in the world. It's a sobering statement. If you were to receive, if you're a, an early Christian and you were to receive this letter from Peter and he were to tell you that you had an enemy, it would be a sobering statement. But I think how sobering that Jesus even said to Peter himself, hey, Satan's going to sift you. He even told Peter himself, Satan is going to, he's going to mess with you. And so Peter knows about this enemy that I'm speaking about this morning. Can you imagine if you were at a zoo with your family and over the PA system came an announcement that a lion had escaped from its enclosure and it was roaming the zoo? You don't have to imagine that because a couple of years ago in Sydney, Australia, a lion escaped from its enclosure and over the PA system they told people a lion has escaped and there's actually protocols in place where they move people inside some of these venues and they shut the doors and they wait until the, the threat is, is taken care of. Can you imagine how frightened you would be if a, a real lion had escaped from its enclosure and was wandering around? That's what Peter pictures here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Lions, of course, are in the top 10 of uh, Africa's most dangerous animals. A male lion can weigh up to 550 pounds. The reason the lion is called the king of the jungle is because it has so few predators. Maybe a crocodile, especially a man with a gun, but uh, having been in uh, Africa many years ago and having witnessed lions walking around, trust me, they're not worried about anything. They roam and walk around wherever they want to because they know no one can touch them. They're not afraid of anything or anyone. And Peter pictures Satan as this, this lion. We have an enemy. He's a real enemy. He's invisible. He's deadly, and he's far deadlier, I think, than any lion on the face of this earth. I alluded to these verses already in Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places so there are a few things that I want you to know about this and you've got in your um, outline uh, this morning it doesn't look like we're going to be able to, to do a PowerPoint this morning but in your outline you'll at least have these four things these uh, these uh, strategies the territory the frailty of this of this lion number one I want to talk about his identity he is the Bible says an adversary the devil the word adversary means enemy or an opponent in a conflict he is oh well there you go you have not because you ask not um, our our enemy let me move on to this next one um, his identity is he is our adversary Do you know the devil means slanderer or one who slanders or accuses. The word devil is used 54 times uh, in, excuse me, 35 times in the scriptures, 
54 times the scriptures call the devil Satan, five times he's called the evil one, eight times he's called the wicked one, he's called the destroyer and a host of other names. In fact, Jesus called him a liar and a father of lies. In Genesis chapter 3, his career begins, and in Revelation chapter 20, it ends. So he spans at least the life of all of human history. Some people flinch when they hear someone like me preaching about a literal devil. And the reason I say that is because the majority of the world now does not believe in a literal Satan or devil. In fact, the the latest polls show that even half of Christians or people who claim to be born-again Christians believe in a literal devil. In fact, what they believe is that there is some form of evil out there or that the devil is a metaphor for something bad that may happen to us in our life. 70%, according to Gallup organization, 70% of Americans believe in the devil, but they believe he's a metaphor. That doesn't bother me as much as the, the next Gallup poll that was taken that asked this question or made this statement and asked people whether they agreed with it or not. The devil is not a living being. He is a symbol of evil. 32% Christians said they strongly agreed. 11% said they agreed somewhat. And then 5% said they did not know, which means either uh, they didn't know or they didn't believe it. Most 50% of those that were claimed to be born-again Christians believe that the devil was a metaphor and not a real person. In a poll mentioned in an article entitled Christians, uh, entitled Christians Don't Believe in the Devil Anymore, it claims that 65% of all people that claim to be Christians don't believe in a devil. So the issue, like so many issues that we study about and talk about within the body of Christ, is it's an issue of authority. And in other words, where do you get your information as to what you believe? Some, and most people, get it from our culture. Well, our culture does believes it's a metaphor. The devil's a metaphor. So our culture kind of steers us in what we believe, our tradition. Well, this is what's handed down. This is what's been taught to me all of these years. Our friends. My friends don't believe in a devil, so I don't believe in a devil. A lot of times that's our authority and then how we feel at the moment. Well, I got to tell you, Jesus believed in a devil. (laughs) In fact, what I, want to, what I want to show you, and just for a real quick, I, want you, and I don't want you to glance at this a lot, but I want you to think about how he refers to the devil. He never refers to the devil or Satan as an it. It's always him. It's a personal pronoun. In other words, Jesus saw the devil as a real entity, not a metaphor of someone that was evil and that we do business with every day. Now, Peter pictures Satan as a, as a roaring lion, and he's seeking to devour. He's wandering around. He wears, if you will, a disguise. In fact, Jesus says he doesn't show up so many times like a lion. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You don't know he's a lion. That's how Satan appears so many times. It's a cover-up. It's, it is deception. Uh, Satan first appears in the garden and to Eve. He starts, he's a good guy. You know, what, what, oh, what do you mean you can't eat of that fruit? The Lord's, God's trying to keep you from something. There's some good stuff waiting for you. You don't see Satan, even from the very beginning, as a roaring lion, someone to be afraid of. You see him as someone who's looking out for your best interest. And Eve, of course, makes that mistake. Many of you, like me, watched a movie many years ago called The Passion of Christ, Mel Gibson. Uh, did this movie called The Passion of Christ. And in that movie, I don't know if you, if you saw the movie, that Satan was depicted, um, as you could, well, you really couldn't see um, so many times a face when Satan arrived on the scene. And the inter- someone that interviewed Mel Gibson was really confused about this and said, you know, sometimes Satan in this movie looks like a beautiful woman and sometimes it looks like this hideous creature and it, you really can't tell what it is. And Mel Gibson said, that's exactly how Satan is. You know, you, you, it looks good on the outside. It may look beautiful, but you really don't know till you see the other side of the coin, the ugliness of that spectrum. So the ugly, brutal lion goes undetected, and everyone has, as I mentioned, a relationship with him. He's either our enemy 
or he is our friend. And by the way, it is better that you are an enemy, that he is an adversary, he is an opponent of yours, than he is your friend. He has an identity, he always has, and until God puts him away forever, he always, he always will. Secondly, there is a, a strategy. The Bible says that the devil walks about, he prowls seeking someone to devour. He's looking, one translation says he's looking for somebody to eat. It's a powerful word, the word devour. Jesus said in John 10 that the thief comes for no other reason except to still kill and destroy. His number one job is to get people in hell. This may surprise you, but the devil is not in hell right now. One day he will be. He's not going to be in charge in hell. He's going to be the chief victim. But he wants, misery loves company, and he wants us to join him in hell. And so he is working to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible in Matthew chapter 25 says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It was never intended for other people. And like I said, misery loves company, and so he's trying to get those in hell. And by the way, there are some people who say they're going to resist the devil, as this text says. They're going to say yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're going to say no to Satan, but he'll still work on you. In fact, I think we Christians are the primary target of Satan. And if he can't get us to say, to say no to Jesus Christ and get us on a path, a, a broad road to destruction, then he will render us weak and anemic and ineffective. He always has. He'll use politics. He will use, he will use a pandemic. He'll use a virus. He'll use a post on Facebook. He will use your boat and your career. He will use anything to divide you and to get you to think that you are less than what you are as God's child, and he is a master at it. And so he has a, a strategy. And I think there are some Christians that they said yes to Jesus and they've said no to Satan, but he has rendered them so ineffective and you just cannot avoid doing a battle with this enemy. Satan is hungry and gullible, ill-prepared Christians, I believe, are on his menu. And so he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking to devour. Peter didn't have a zoo. Zoos are fairly, uh, I don't know, they, they, they haven't been around for a long. Peter didn't, let, let me just tell you, Peter wasn't walking around a zoo eating peanuts going, you know what, I think the Lord through inspiration wants me to write about lions, looking at a lion in an enclosure. I do think there were lions in the Middle East. They saw lions. Remember David said, I killed a lion with my bare hands. So there were lions. There lions now have of course, uh, uh, kind of moved about, um, and uh, they've become extinct in many continents, and they only exist in a few, and it's kind of interesting to, to read about that, but I don't have any way of proving this, but I believe after my study, what I think Peter had in mind when he wrote this is he had the idea of watching Christians being persecuted, being fed to lions for Roman entertainment. What he, what he, he, did, he wasn't talking about a zoo or, or a lion that he was worried about walking around on the side. He knew firsthand that Christians were being persecuted and part of Roman entertainment was cutting these lions loose and watching those lions eat people that claimed that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter saw that firsthand and he saw the damage a lion could do and that's what he's talking about when he's speaking about this strategy of, of so profound, I think, the wording of a lion prowling and looking at the right time for it to pounce. Now, in the book of Job, in Job chapter 1, remember, Satan appears before God, and God asked Job a really interesting question. He said, have you been considering my servant Job? And what the word considering, it's a military word that actually is talking about studying someone. What God is actually saying, he's not putting Job up and saying, hey, you ought to go look at him. Or, or He's saying, have you been studying him? Have you been considering my servant Job? And there's this conversation that takes place about Job. And remember, what Satan does toward Job is he, 
he questions his motives. But what I want to show you there is that Satan does this, he considers. Several years ago, I mean, maybe two years ago, it wasn't very long ago, Kay was in Walmart, and she was shopping by herself. It was eight, nine o'clock, and she happened to notice this young man on the same aisle kind of picking up a canned good. He didn't have a cart, and he was just kind of watching her, and, which is amazing because Kay doesn't notice anything, okay? And so she went to the next aisle, and she was shopping, and she saw the same young man. And so she went a couple aisles away and looked for him, and sure enough, he appeared, and he was on his phone, and he would just pick up something and look at whatever it was, and he would watch her. If someone did that to you, that would creep you out, wouldn't it? So she put, she actually left her cart there and went out to her car, and when she went out to her car, there were some young men around her car, I'm assuming that this guy was talking to, and they moved away from her car. This is when she had her ye little yellow T-bird. And so she got in her car and she moved it to, I would have come home, but she moved it to another place in Walmart and she went back into the store and checked out and she came home and then she tells me the story. I would have preferred her to call me. And so I went out and I thought, what would those guys, they're not trying to take off the tires, the wheels. And I went back and already they had removed one of the screws from the tag on the back of her car and it was hanging by one screw and they were in the process of, they were going to carjack her, there's no doubt in my mind. And they were watching and waiting, someone was watching and waiting and studying her to see where she was in the store giving those guys time. And the, what I'm saying is actively every day there is, there is someone, an enemy doing that to you, studying you. And they are watching you, they are watching me, and they are looking because of, um, because of what's going on in our life. They use some bad habit. It, it could be lying, it could be lust, it, 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 whatever it is, they know whatever the bait is for you, it may be different for me. I think there is a common thread of temptation that goes through all of us, but Satan is studying you and I to see where our weaknesses are so he can pounce on us. That's what lions do when they attack, by the way. They, they pounce on us. And so whatever the temptation he sends our way, it is, it's custom made. Satan operates, I think, within parameters. Um, I think in, in reading the Bible, remember Jesus cast out those demons to the guy in Gadara, and remember the demons said, will you give us permission to go into the swine? They couldn't go anywhere without permission. Uh, Satan operates within certain parameters, and, and he has a leash. Uh, we know, according to Colossians, on the cross, Jesus took care of him, but he's still operating in this world. He's still tempting. He's still accusing. He's doing whatever he needs to do in order to get us to uh, divide or especially to, to follow him. And it makes me feel good, by the way, if I'm going through a trial, I'm going through a temptation, that also God is looking at me. He has his hand on the thermostat, and the Bible says that you and I are not going to be tempted beyond what we're, we're capable or able. Um, he's not going to allow us to be, to be uh, tempted beyond what we're able to endure. So there's another thing real quick, and that is his territory. Right before I left to Africa, Larry was a young teenager, and he said, Dad, I, I, I just want you to bring me back a lion's tooth you know, if you don't mind. And the only lion's tooth I saw were in the mouth of lions and like they were laying around on the ground somewhere and I never did bring him a lion's tooth. But a lion's territory is anywhere he wants to go. A lion's territory is anywhere he wants to work. The territory, the Bible says, resist him steadfast knowing that the same suffering, this is verse nine, are, are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. So there are two things here. One is, it's experienced by the brotherhood. I think he's talking about fellow Christians. He's talking about the church. And secondly, the realm of Satan is the world. He has the whole world to roam in. Did you know that Jesus, at least three times in the New Testament, calls Satan the ruler of this world? We sing a song that says, this is my father's world. It's a great song. And this is our father's world by way of creation. He made it. This is our 
Father's world by way of control and sovereignty, but this is Satan's territory and he can roam anywhere he wants to go. He's after your kids, he's after your grandkids, he's, he, is, he wants to do business with everybody and his, the world is his, if you will, a platform or his canvas. Now like lion, kind of be considered the king uh, of the beast and he, go, he goes wherever he wants, that's what you see in the Bible with Satan. He's moving about, he's not in hell, he never has been, and one day he will be, we, he will be uh, in hell. And like I said earlier, he's not going to be in charge. He's, he's going to be in chains. But right now he is wandering, and we are his principal target. First, he hates the Lord. From the very beginning, if you know your Bible, you know in the book of Genesis, God said there's coming someone who's going to crush your head, Satan, and that is the promised Messiah. So he knows that his arch enemy, if you will, is, is the Lord. So he hates the Lord, and he hates anything or anyone that has to do with the Lord, his angels and those that will follow him. The, the word devil means accuser or slanderer. Revelation chapter 12, he's called the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses us. He accuses before God. Remember Job and his motives, and he's always accusing you and I. No wonder sometimes thoughts pop into your head. Why would anybody listen to me? Why would I do this? You know, look, I know my life. I know my thought life. You know, who would take me seriously? I know, I know what I'm all about. There's always this accusation going on in our minds, and I'll talk about this uh, a little later. I think there is another, and uh, um, Frank mentioned this in his beautiful prayer earlier, and that is persecution. Not only does he use uh, accusation because he is the accuser of the brethren, but he uses persecution. If Satan can persecute us, he can shut us down. If we feel, feel threatened or fear in our life, we will sit down and not do anything. He persecuted believers. Well, no wonder so much of the New Testament is encouraging people who are being persecuted. Uh, even when Frank prayed that this morning, I think there are people thinking or to themselves or saying, you know, we're not being persecuted, we're meeting here. Did you know that around the world there are so many people that claim to be born-again Christians that are being persecuted that it has been said that more people have been persecuted in the last 100 years than between Jesus Christ coming into this world and up to 100 years ago? That more people have been martyred because of their faith, because of claiming to believe in God or having the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior in the last hundred years, more people have been persecuted. Satan uses persecution as a way of shutting down uh, Christians. It is his identity, it is his strategy, and there is his, his territory. And I saved the, the, the best for last, and that is uh, his frailty. Uh, he can be, in fact, he must be engaged. I think a lot of people hear a sermon like this and think, you know what? I'm in church, I don't have to worry about the devil, or I'm going to stay in my home, I don't have to worry about the devil. Listen, y'all, you have to engage this enemy. You cannot ignore an enemy like this. You, no wonder Paul said you've got to put on the full armor of God. There are some things that you need to actively do, pro, be proactive in your faith, and he can be defeated. So the Bible says, back into verse 8 and 9, that we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, we need to resist him, in our faith and so he has to be engaged when you hear the word be sober i know people think well i'm not intoxicated he's talking about mentally sober we need to be in our right minds we need to be in our right thinking because that's where satan attacks us y'all he uses our minds don't you think he worked on me in the hospital don't you think he's working on people right now even as they listen to the sermon at home that he is constantly, his battleground is our mind, and he's constantly in our minds. When I hear about people that I know that are friends that during this COVID shutdown have become so discouraged that they thought about taking their lives, don't you think he is working in their minds? That Satan is always not only accusing and persecuting, but he is working on us to get us just to give up. And I want to tell you that it's always too soon to quit, so we need to be sober-minded we need to think right, and we are governed by our thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and it has always been that way. And in fact, I think every 
behavioral scientists that exist on the planet now will tell you that people make decisions by their subconscious thoughts. It is what we think about all day long that we become. And if Satan can get into your mind and make you convince you that you are something other or you ought to do something other than what, he, that what God wants you to do, um, you will do it. Be vigilant. Be alert. That's the second thing. We need to not only be sober, we need to be, we need to be alert, alert. We need to be on the lookout. Peter would know about this, wouldn't he? Peter, James, and John were in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember what Jesus told them? They kept falling asleep. Falling asleep. Wake them up. And uh, he'd come back. They'd be asleep. Do you remember what he said? You've got to be on the alert. You've got to watch out. That's what he's saying. You've got to be vigilant. He kept waking Peter up saying, this is what I want you to be in this world. It's the idea of being awake, it's of, of being alert. You need to watch out. Watch out for what? Watch out for the attacks. Watch out for being in a, putting yourself in a compromising position. You know, look out for uh, being in a situation that's gonna be difficult for you to resist. Be sober, be vigilant, be resolute. I love this, resist him so he can be resisted. James 4 says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And he says, resist him in the faith. He's not talking about your faith or my faith. He's talking about the faith. I think this is really important, by the way. Because what is the faith? But it's a body of information given by the scriptures that's passed on to us. So we need to be, in other words, we need to know the Bible. Remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan? And by the way, if Jesus can be tempted by Satan, all of us can. But Jesus was tempted, remember, in the wilderness by Satan. Do you remember how he responded? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. You can't say that if you don't know what's written. So one of the reasons that we need to be vigilant and we need to be resolute is that we're going to resist him in the faith. We're not going to just re resist him on our own. We're going to resist him in the power of the word of God. And then the fourth thing and the final thing that I think is so important, and it, I think it's, it's not said here, but it's implied, and that is we need to do this together. Be sober, be vigilant. Those are, by the way, commands. They're imperatives. And they're written in the second person. In other words, he's not writing to one person. He's writing to a group of people. Who is Peter writing to? He's writing to the church. And you and I are always stronger together. One of the things that Satan always tries to do is divide the church. He is always. I, listen, I've been at this for long enough to know that he will use anything, a bulletin arg or article, uh, the way I said hello to somebody in a restaurant, he will use anything to divide us and get us to go do something else other than to worship him and to have him first place in our life. He will use everything. And so we need to be together. Do you, you know what they do in, the lions do in Africa when they're hunting? They, they want to cut somebody away from the herd. They want, in fact, when they, if they're hungry enough and they attack a group of elephants, which is sometimes a bad mistake, what elephants do is they gather together around the smaller, the baby elephants or the weaker elephants, the bigger elephants actually gather around them and they put them in the middle because they know if lions cut them away from the herd, they will have their, uh, they will have their afternoon meal. And all I'm saying is that there may be some people listening to this later on today or they're watching this on YouTube or they're watching this as we stream live and they're thinking, you know what, I can do Christianity all by myself and you would be wrong because I cannot do it alone nor can you do it alone. We have to do this together. I need the herd and you need the herd and as imperfect as we are, we need each other. And I wanna close by saying that as vicious as this lion is, and he certainly is because he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a second-rate lion. He's a rug in front of a fireplace. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Several times in the Bible, as the Lord is spoken of in the book of Revelation, I looked and I saw the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. C.S. Lewis wrote, remember, the Chronicles of Narnia. You remember how he, he represented the the king of all the beast and the ruler of all really this world. He was a lion of the tribe of Judah. Amos in chapter 1, the prophet predicted that the Lord will roar from Zion. And certainly at the cross, Jesus 
the lion of the tribe of Judah roared, and his last words, it is finished. Paul said in Colossians that he did everything that he came to do, and Satan could not stop him. I love the verse that says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He can be resisted, and he can be defeated, and he doesn't have to have his way with us. But we have to see him operating in our life. I think every once in a while I just stop and say, you know what, why am I feeling this way? This isn't the way, this isn't the thinking God would want me to have. You run it through uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, this isn't how God would want me thinking about someone or situation. I need to be winning a soul, not rejecting one. And so many times Satan will do, will do that to us. He'll get us to make an enemy instead of try to win a soul to him. What a good song that Chaz has chosen today for us to end with, this, especially this lesson. Let him have his way with thee. And certainly what we want is God to have his way with us in our life. We don't want Satan to have his way with us. I hope young people have heard me today. I hope our young people know that Satan is going to try to get them, whether they're far away in college, away from their mom and dad. Um, he's going to try to get them to make Poor decisions he's going to tempt them but they can resist the devil they can flee uh, in uh, opportunities when they need to get out of situations and not put themselves in a compromising situation sometimes you just need to get up and leave sometimes you need to maybe bite your tongue and not continue a conversation maybe you need to not respond to someone you know in maybe the way you originally think it's maybe you, you think that think that through and uh I can't tell you how many conversations I have or a response I've had with someone that I thought, man, I got to say what I wanted to say. And then later on, I thought, man, I, I, I might have said what I wanted to say, but I said it in a way that wasn't godly. And instead of, instead of winning a soul, I just won an argument. And so, so I think so many times, and he certainly has used me and he's used you and he will continue to work on us. We can resist him. I hope the elderly are listening to me today to know that it doesn't matter how old you get, you will always do business with him. He will never leave you alone. And you are loved, and God has a place for you, and our best days are ahead of us, and heaven is our home. And with all the stuff going on in the world, we need to remember that our citizenship is in heaven, and we need to eagerly wait for that citizenship. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let God have his way with you today. Make him the center of your life that you might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, willing to confess him, willing to be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. God wants to be first place in your life, and he wants to help you put on the full armor of God and resist the weaponry of Satan that will come in your life. You can defeat him, and maybe some of you have felt defeated because he's, he's gotten to you. And he's brought you down, but you're here today. You know, that's why I thought as soon as it ticked into 2021, hey, I made it. <laughs> I'm here. N not all of me, but I'm partly here, you know. I, I got 85% of my lungs made it into 2021. But whatever part of me, God wants to use that to his glory. You're here. And you're here this morning. You've made mistakes. Guess what? All of us have made mistakes. All of us have been his pawns. But we can also turn that around. We don't have to keep that same habit in our life. We don't have to keep that same voice in our life that we'll listen to the voice of God today instead of listening to the voice of an accuser. And my prayer is that you'll listen to him today, the voice of God. I'll be here at the front. You come as we stand and sing the song of accuser. Bear your burden, carry all your load. Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. Twas best for him to have his way with thee. 
Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. Twas best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find the place of constant rest? Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see Twas best for him to have his way with thee. You may be seated. Sorry. <laughs> As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let us sing, Love Lifted Me. Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to him, him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Good morning. As we begin a new year, right, every year we begin to think about how we can change things, how we can do things different, how we can do things better. And every week we get together and we celebrate, we commemorate 
the memory of what Jesus gave to us, what he did for us by giving his life. That happens every week, whether it's the first Sunday of the new year or the last Sunday of the year. Every week we get together and we remember what he did. And in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And we think about the new year as, as, as being fresh, as being a, a time where we can, we can change things. But the truth is there, there are two times when you really get to start over. You, you get a new birth, a new beginning. It's, it's when you're born and when you're reborn. And that's only possible because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And that's what we have a chance to remember every week, not just every year, but every Sunday when we get together and we remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. I want to look at some other verses real quick. Uh, turn, to me to, uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And Paul here speaking uh, in verse 11 says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Right? Jesus did that for us. Jesus, Jesus brought us near to him through his blood, through his sacrifice, through his giving up his body on that cross. And that's what we have a chance every week to think about and to remember and to celebrate. If you would, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us, Lord. As we take this time as we take this moment to think about your son and to remember the sacrifice that he made for us for the body that he gave up on on that cross lord on that tree that as we take this bread that that memorializes memorizes that sacrifice that we would do it in a way that that pleases you and honors you and and remembers him it's in his name that we pray amen I want to continue reading some of those verses in Ephesians. In verse 14, he says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. If you would, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take this cup, which represents the blood that Christ shed on the cross, I pray, Lord, that we would take it in a way, uh, again, that remembers what that sacrifice means to us and, and to our life and to our life beyond this, this one uh, and in this world. I pray that you'd help us to remember that that sacrifice was made so that so that we could be brought together, so that people could be united, and so that we could be one, Lord, in you. And I thank you so much, Lord, for, for what that means to us and for Jesus being willing to pay that ultimate price for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
we now also have the opportunity uh, to give back of what uh, God has given to us, of what he's blessed us with. We have this opportunity every week uh, to be able to help continue the work uh, that goes on here at the church uh, so that we can use those funds to, to help those who are in need and, and to be able to keep the things in this building uh, running and to be able to, to have these services. Uh, God doesn't want us uh, to give a certain amount. We know in the Old Testament they talked about tithing and, and, and a certain percentage. God says he wants us to give from our heart. Not, the Bible says, begrudgingly, uh, but he wants us to give freely. And so we have that opportunity now. If you're uh, joining with us online, you can do that uh, online. You can do that uh, if you're here. You can drop your uh, collection in the, the boxes at the back uh, as you leave. Uh, but this is another way that, that we honor God uh, in the things that he's done for us. If you would, uh, please bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, the ways that you've blessed us, Lord. Thank you so much for allowing us to live in a country where we do have uh, so many freedoms, Lord, where we do have so many opportunities. And even when uh, there's times when we struggle, Lord, that we realize that, that we still are, are very much blessed and we still very much have more than, than so many other countries, Lord. I pray that you'd uh, help us, Lord, as we uh, take this time to give back uh, some of what we've been blessed monetarily. I pray that you'd help us uh, to, to do that in a way that's, uh, that, that we're willing and not begrudging, Lord, that we do it with an uh, open heart, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to, to use those funds in a way that, that we can help other people, that we can reach people in the community, Lord, and that we can help people who are truly in need. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Once again, it's wonderful to see you all here today. Happy New Year. I'm praying that this year will um, bring love and prosperity to you all. As we end our worship for today, let us sing Hilltops of Glory. Hilltops of Glory. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warnings heed. Evil allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the upward trail. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Amen. Our Holy Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for another Lord's Day you've given us to come together and hear another portion of your word. Lord, we ask that you will help us to take this into our hearts, take us into our homes, and take it to our neighbors and our co-workers, and uh, spread the word, Lord. Lord, help us to make uh, this new year a time that we focus on uh, spreading the word and uh, bringing others to Christ. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are in the bulletins, that are in our hearts, that are in our minds, um, people that we know, uh, those who are sick, those who have lost loved ones, those ones who have lost their jobs, those ones who are uh, financially struggling. Lord, please be with them and lift them up. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with this church and help it to grow, help it to stay strong. And Lord, uh, please help it to keep the devil out. Lord, we ask that you be with us this week as we um, uh, continue our lives, as we 
um, our examples to others that you will help us to be strong and be um, um, good Christian men and women and show and prove our faith. And all these things we say in uh, your name, amen.